good evening friends today we welcome you in our live lectures today with us in our studio we have dr eklavya chauhan dr chauhan is associate professor in deshpandu college delhi university in department of botany today the topic of discussion is uh, mechanism of sex determination which fall under the series of genetics we uh, we already had six lectures on this series and today we'll be discussing the topic if you have any questions regarding this topic or this lecture you can call us uh, in last 10 minutes of this lecture on our toll free number and for that please note our toll free number it is 1800 110430 Let me repeat it again. The number is one eight double zero double one zero four three zero. Let's welcome Dr. Chauhan. We welcome you, Dr. Chauhan, and let's discuss the mechanism of sex. Thank you very much. Uh, in our earlier lectures, we had talked about the fundamentals of Mendelism and the principles of genetics. How the characters were being transferred from the parents to the uh, other offsprings and the future generations now today's lecture talks about sex determination so whether it was adam or eve any person of any caste creed religion language nationality everyone would invariably ask the question a boy or a girl it's so it comes so naturally to us that we never even think as to how do we get a boy or we get a girl that means is there any distinction in nature regarding the sexes of the offspring how is it that a child is born is either a boy or a girl are there any well defined mechanisms are they predictable and how are they controlled is it only the genes that they control uh, the sex of the future individual or is it the environmental factors hormones and other criteria which are going to finally decide as to what is going to be the sex of the future child uh, let's begin with the idea of he and she or i should say he or she sex itself uh, the term is from the latin root sexus which means a section or separation so that means in the first instance we are distinguishing between two different types of morphologies obviously their phenotypes are going to be different the characters which we see on their faces and on their bodies and in their functionings are definitely different this phenomenon we call as the sexual dimorphism sexual dimorphism would mean that their each of the sexes has unique primary as well as secondary sexual characters which means that they are going to uh, they are going to appear differently phenotypically their functioning is also going to be different their behavior to a certain extent is also going to be different so this is what we mean by sexual dimorphism but then let's not restrict our discussion only to human beings and our kids because if we come across the entire diversity of living organisms we have to talk about the invertebrates the lower forms the mammals and of course not to mention the plants so how are the sexes distinguished in lower forms is it the same manifestation in case of higher plants and specially us that is the placental mammals or are there any uh, differences the diversity shows that some of the lower forms i just said he or she but in lower forms say for example one variety of a ciliated protozoan paramecium would have as many as eight sexes although we cannot go out of the distinction of he and she but then these eight forms of different sexes cannot be distinguished morphologically then how do we distinguish them they would be distinguished on the basis of their mating behavior 
it would be seen that they would be better called as mating types simply because all of them look identical as far as their morphology is concerned but then their behavior that is their mating behavior is different in other words each of the mating type would exchange its genetic material only with the other seven types and not with its own type so that means there is a proper mechanism by which this particular mating type does recognize that this is one of us and therefore one should not mate in other words one should not exchange the genetic material with our own type so this also leads to sexual diversity although phenotypically there is absolutely no distinction this would be a distinction on the behavioral side or the physiological side of course which would be determined by the genes themselves however we could just distinguish by saying that usually usually there are two sexes male and female and then we continue on uh, on this theory if we were to see the two different types of sexes in uh, uh, the uh, plant and the animal world we have beautiful examples of a lion and a lioness a lion having a beautiful large majestic mane and the lioness as usual for a female very very fast in her prowess and being the 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 better hunter and of course uh, having the parental care on the other hand the morphological features and the behavior of uh, a peacock and uh, a peahen are also well recognized such a beautiful plumage of the peacock by which he courts the peahen at the mating season likewise we have the majestic deer with the uh, large branched antlers and the uh, innocent looking doe or the female deer uh, there are umpteen number of examples in animals which show uh, and exhibit this type of a sexual dimorphism coming to plants the most common uh, idea that a child gets is that the fruits are born on a female plant of papaya there are male plants of papaya which are separate and their inflorescences are different but of course the fruit is going to be born on the female plants themselves likewise the plant of hemp uh, that is cannabis sativa they also have distinct male and female plants we'll come to the terminology a bit later uh, but the two inflorescences are distinctly different uh, Uh, as far as the male and the females are concerned and people who uh, who are in the hemp industry or who are botanists or even who are consumers of hemp know very well that it is the the female plant which has perhaps more alkaloids as compared to the male ones so that means there is a distinction between not just the morphology of the two different sexes but their behavior their alkaloids their 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 chemistry and their functioning everything is common yet different so the term or the dictum is common yet different because these two sexes have to complement each other when we talk of the terminology used in sex determination as i said before the two common sexes that we distinguish are males and the females however there are many animals and plants where the male and the female reproductive organs would be present on the same individual this would be a case in case of animals as hermaphrodite just to avoid uh, uh, many of the lower forms you, you take for example uh, an earthworm there are male and the female reproductive organs so it is a hermaphrodite and there are specific latin uh, symbols which are ascribed to it uh, in order to avoid confusion of any kind we generally do not use the terminology of uh, hermaphrodite in case of plants 
we would like to use the term monoecious or dioecious we would say that if both male and the female flowers are present on the same plant or whether this is in the form of male and the female flowers or whether a plant has flowers which have both the sexes that means both the uh, essential whorls that is the stamens and pistils on the same flower it would be called as a bisexual flower so by that analogy a bisexual flower would also be a part of the monoecism or the monoecious plants <clears throat> on the other hand we have the condition of dioecious that is where the male and the female plant, uh, flowers are present on different individuals so we have the male plants and we have uh, there is the staminate ones and we have the female ones that is the pistillate ones so uh, most of the flowering plants which we have are most of them are bisexual flowers and they are also called as perfect flowers as against the unisexual ones which are imperfect now it would be the purview of uh, taxonomy to talk about uh, which of them that is the monoecism or dioecism or perfect or imperfect flowers whether they are primitive or advanced but here we uh, talk about the different type of terminologies of the permutations and combinations which we could have uh, in terms of flowers or in terms of their sex expression hermaphrodite would definitely mean all perfect flowers which means all the flowers are bisexual that is they have the stamens as well as the pistils and then there are other terms which i have just described as monoecious and dioecious then there are some terms which further signify the intricacies of sexuality so for example we have a plant which would be designated as endromonoecious it would mean that this particular plant has a perfect flower as well as another set of male or the staminate flowers on the same plant yet it is uh, completing the definition of monoecious but then there is an additional uh, male flower so we call it as endromonoecious likewise we have the gynomonoecious ones which have the perfect as well as an additional presence of the female uh, flowers on the same plant there could be other permutations also for example like trimonoecious which has a combination of perfect a female as well as male flowers on the same plant there are so many ecological and evolutionary implications of having a trimonoecious plant although it's a, it's a primitive character because as you can see perfectly all the options of sexuality are open and when all the options are open that means there is less of or rather least of specialization endrodioecious flowers would be which are different plants but then one of them has a perfect flower and the other one has a male flower only and not the female flower so it's that the female part is taken care of by the by the perfect flower on one of the plants whereas gynodioecious condition would mean that they are on on a separate plant we have a perfect set of flowers and on the other on on a separate plant we have the female plant so that means this type of a terminology needs to be elaborated in case of plants maybe a an analogous situation does not uh, exist in animals at the most there could be rudimentary sex organs in some of the uh, lower animals have you ever thought as to we have talked about male and female and a bisexual or a perfect flower what really controls the sex of an individual as i said in the beginning the mechanism could include the genetic control which is of course the main control but then 
one should realize that the genic controls are not working in complete isolation. The action of genes, their manifestation, their expression, their blockage, their uh, switches have to be controlled by various metabolic factors and more importantly hormonal controlled mechanisms are the ones which are really triggering the uh, genetically uh, controlled mechanisms. And lastly, one should not forget the environmentally controlled mechanisms. Uh, you must have heard about a, a fly, a young fly eating a royal jelly and converting itself or metamorphosing itself into a fertile queen and in the absence of eating any royal jelly it becomes a sterile worker. So that means maybe genetically they were uh, identical we would see later but then it was the nutrition which was given to them changed the course of their development. <clears throat> and let us begin with uh, the genetically controlled uh, sex determining mechanisms because uh, we know that in our karyotype we have 46 chromosomes in our diploid cells or the diploid component. So that means our gametes would carry 23 chromosomes. Just to classify these chromosomes we have to first see that the genetically controlled mechanisms would be essentially based on the sex chromosomes. So, sex chromosomes are entities which are chromosomes all right, they are present in our complement, but then their behavior uh, or the genes that they harbor are different from the ones which are controlling our body characters and they are the ones which may be triggering certain hormones which are responsible for the genesis of maleness or femaleness. So, since they are different they would be called as the heterosomes or allosomes. These are the two uh, synonyms which are used in place of sex chromosomes. Then later we would talk about the balance of genes. It is not necessary that always we are talking about the sex chromosomes. There could be uh, the involvement of autosomes also in this uh, sex determining mechanism which would be uh, striking a balance between the autosomes and the sex chromosomes. And interestingly there are situations in, in uh, lower animals where it depends whether an organism is haploid or it has the double set of chromosomes or diploid and that would decide the fate of sex of an organism whether it would be a male or a female. So that is also very primitive but a very interesting mechanism of sex determination. In certain other cases there are just single gene effects which may be following the Mendelian traits but then they may not necessarily be the sex chromosomes as such. Uh, most of the uh, discussion on sex determination revolves around the sex chromosomes or heterosomes or allosomes as I put it earlier. So, let us first look at the history of uh, sex chromosomes, how were they discovered? They have a very, very interesting history. Karyotypes were known, people were making squash preparations of insects, of plants and they were studying their meiosis, mitosis and uh, beautiful diagrams of chromosomes regarding their number, their structure and their behavior at the time of cell division was seen. But then it was a German scientist by the name Henking who while studying the spermatogenesis in squash bug that is uh, pyrochorus found that actually the uh, preparation showed 11 pairs of chromosomes in the meiotic nuclei. Now 11 pairs would mean 22 chromosomes plus there was an unpaired element which moved to the poles. 
Now this would make the total of 11 into 2 plus 1 which is 23. Now this is not the done thing in cytology because one of them would be uh, an odd chromosome and equal number of chromosomes uh, it is desirable that they would move at the time of meiosis to the respective poles. So this raised a certain uh, alarm in the minds of Henking as to what was this odd element and that was also moving. So definitely it would be something like a chromosome he was not sure. So he called it as an unknown body or an X body. His interpretation initially was that perhaps it would be a uh, heterochromatic uh, body or likened to a nucleolus, but he was not very sure about it. Many years later, uh, the American um, cytologist McClung, while studying the uh, gametogenesis in another insect, grasshopper, which is uh, Xiphidium, he also confirmed the work of Henking and he came to a conclusion that this X body was present and it had perhaps its behavior quite similar to those of the chromosomes. So he said that this is some sort of an accessory chromosomes. We really do not know how this chromosome is, is wandering uh, in isolation or uh, it, it is a, a solitary one. Because uh, McClung found out that uh, in many of the preparations, the female had 24 chromosomes. That means there were 12 pairs, but the male had 11 pairs, which is 22 plus one odd chromosome and that is a total of 23 chromosomes. So the story fitted very well with, uh, with the initial work of Henking. It was uh, again the scientist Wilson in 1905 while working on uh, one of the bug, Trotinor, a lot of work has been done on this. He finally gave an idea as to uh, the female had had seven pairs and uh, the male had six pairs plus one unpaired chromosome. So that means the female had 14 and the male always had one less chromosome. Now that means one less means that the, the number of pairs also was one less. It was six pairs and one was unpaired. So he gave the final terminology uh, 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 Wilson gave the final terminology as unpaired chromosome to be called as the X chromosome. This is how uh, the work of Wilson uh, christened the term X chromosome. Miss uh, Nettie Stevens was also working on uh, several beetles and uh, she found out that uh, although Males and females in this beetle uh, tenebrio have same number of chromosomes, but one of the chromosomes in males, although we, we have the pairs, it is slightly different in size. So that means one of the pairs is not homomorphic, it is heteromorphic. In the female, all the pairs are the, the, that is the members of the homologous pairs, they are uh, similar, so they are homomorphic, but then there is something odd about one of the chromosomal complements in one of the pairs in males. And she showed conclusively that this particular smaller chromosome is never present in the females. So she drew some sort of a cursory connection between the presence of this chromosome and maleness, since it is present always in the males and later such chromosomes were also found in uh, the famous fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster and uh, this established the fact that the Y chromosome is always smaller than the X chromosome because Stephen had given the term Y chromosome. So now we have two types of uh, sex chromosomes, X and Y. X always is bigger. And uh, finally, Stevens and Wilson, 
they gave the hypothesis that uh, in male the X chromosome is always larger and its homologue is always smaller. Now, it is a matter of discussion. The pair of chromosomes which we are designating as X and Y, we are still keeping them in a pair and we are still calling them as homologues. By definition, a homologue should be able to exchange certain genetic material which we would subsequently see that there are certain specialized regions or areas where they actually exchange the genetic material. So, to summarize, we have two types of uh, chromosomes discovered say so far in our discussion, autosomes where the genes would be present which control all our somatic characters and the sex chromosomes or allosomes or heterosomes which are responsible for the uh, determination of sex that is whether the organism or the offspring is going to be a male or a female and they are the X and Y. Uh, some very interesting aspects we discussed in our earlier discussions on Mendelism, but then they were the genic principles. Uh, if you were to think in the colossal number of X and Y chromosomes, one should uh, understand the fact that uh, at the time of uh, uh, the sexual contact, the average human ejaculate is going to contain 100, a staggering 175 million spermatozoa which have X bearing chromosomes or X chromosomes and an equal number that is 175 million of Y bearing spermatozoa. So, that means Okay, we could start this again now. Friends, as we were discussing just prior to uh, a short break, that uh, an average uh, human ejaculate contains a staggering number of 350 million spermatozoa and the number of X bearing spermatozoa is exactly equal to the number of Y bearing spermatozoa that is 175 million each. Now, 
the sex of the child would depend on which of these spermatozoa, just one in most of the cases, fuses with the ovum and the ovum would always be X bearing ovum. So, one can realize that the probability of having a male child or a female child is exactly the same 175 versus 175 that is 1 is to 1. In other words, it is 50 percent. This was an oversimplification of the fact. It would depend on the sperm count of an individual. This was only an average. So, our basic idea was that there are only two types of sex chromosomes X and Y, but the very, very interesting case appears in uh, platypus which is a dipteran and uh, some of the dioecious plants where we will find more than one pair of sex chromosomes. Now, presence of more than one sex chromosome is a, is a very primitive character and especially this duck billed platypus is a unique blend of uh, the characters of different phyla that is of the placental mammals, aves that is birds and the reptiles. And it is believed that this organism ha which, which has a, a bill also and, and a tail which releases very potent uh, toxin and venom and uh, there are no uh, memory glands. The milk can be sucked directly from the glands which are present on the, on, on the skin and it is believed that this particular organism which is a, a rare blend of all these phyla uh, deviated genetically uh, from the main um, genetic course about 166 uh, million years ago. <clears throat> Cytologically speaking, the uh, diploid chromosome number is 52 and out of these 52, there are 5 pairs of sex chromosomes. So, that means out of 52, 10 are the sex chromosomes or allosomes and 42 therefore would be the autosomes. If 42 are the autosomes, that means in each of its gametes, 21 autosomes plus 5 of the sex chromosomes, which is 26 would go to the ovum or to the sperms. But uh, interestingly, the females have 10 X chromosomes and the males have 5 X and 5 Y. People thought that there would be a high degree of confusion between uh, 10 chromosomes, how would they pair, they would mismatch, but then it is, it has been found out that there is a perfect matching and also crossing over between these uh, five different pairs and, and the story continues. Uh, recently, the, the uh, complete genome of platypus has also been sequenced and it is believed to have uh, nearly 2.3 billion base pairs of DNA and uh, these 52 chromosomes together, they have uh, about 18,500 protein encoding genes. But then this is a very rare exception that we have 10 sex chromosomes as against the usual two which we usually talk about. Let us again come back to the sex chromosomes of humans. If we look at a detailed uh, picture of the X and the Y uh, as far as their size and their structure is concerned, the X chromosome is much, much larger in size and it is submetacentric. Now, submetacentric would mean that the two arms are unequal, the centromere is somewhere there and uh, the Y chromosome is, is an acrocentric chromosome. 
which means the one of the arms is fairly large and the other arm is small. Uh, you could appreciate the difference in size between the two chromosomes, yet there are certain areas where they also cross over and exchange their genes. A typical human karyotype which is uh, made on the basis of the Denver system of classification because uh, in the city of Denver in the United States, uh, the conference decided that the karyotype of humans, their, the pairs should be arranged in a descending manner of their size. So, one can see that in a female, uh, we have 22 pairs of autosomes which are designated as graphically as 22AA and XX. So, the X chromosomes have been given a separate status, they have been kept separately. But if one looks carefully, the X chromosomes uh, belong somewhere to the chromosomes which have the size say of the number 6 and 7, which we uh, see in the designation as, as the C group of classification. The female is homogametic, that means the two chromosomes or X chromosomes are morphologically identical. Although in this picture there is a little curvature of the X chromosome, but then their size and the position of the centromere are the same. On the other hand, in contrast, the males are designated as 22 AA, which means 22 pairs and XY. If one looks at the Y chromosome, it is so very smaller as compared to the, to the uh, X chromosome and the Y chromosome belongs to the last group that is 21 and 22 which we designate as the G group. Yet we like to according to the Denver system of classification, we disregard the size of the X chromosome, we like to keep it separately because they are a class apart, they are the heterosomes. So, the human male is homogametic, uh, female is uh, homogametic and the male is heterogametic. The characteristics of their size and behavior of these two sex chromosomes are also different. X chromosomes enjoy a fairly large size, they are rod like, they have a very high eochromatin content which means they are genetically fairly active. By saying that they are genetically active, they must be having a large number of genes and the heterochromatin content is low. So, that means most of the X chromosome is in simpler terms functional. On the other hand, the Y chromosome is fairly small and it abounds in heterochromatin. More the heterochromatin, more is the inertness or inactivity of a particular chromosome. And one of the end, one of the ends is curved in case of human beings and in Drosophila we would see later it is Y shaped. But then the content of eochromatin is low and most of the Y chromosome is genetically inert and it has less, comparatively much less number of genes. As I said in the beginning, in spite of a drastic deviation and difference in their sizes, the X and the Y chromosomes are still homologous, but then the homologous nature is restricted to certain specified areas which we see at the terminal ends. So, these are the areas present on the sex chromosomes and yet crossing over thereby saying that they are behaving like autosomes. Since they are not autosomes and present on the sex chromosomes, we give another terminology, we call them as pseudo-autosomal areas. So, by that analogy, any gene which is present on the pseudo-autosomal region of either the X or the Y chromosome would have a tendency to cross over, 
to synapse, to cross over and to recombine. And hence, the distribution of certain traits are not sex specific. In other words, they could change, they could transfer from X to the Y and vice versa. So, this is the importance of the pseudo autosomal regions. But then, as one can see, these regions are percentage wise very, very small as compared to the overall bulk of the X and the Y chromosomes. Having said that, and contrary to the general notion that the Y chromosome is most of it is genetically inert because it has so much of heterochromatin, it is not true entirely. That means there is a lot of activity even on the Y chromosome, although not as hectic as we are accustomed to see on the X chromosome. As compared to the 900 to 4, uh, 1400 genes present on the X chromosomes, which is fairly high, the Y chromosome has uh, about 397 genes and uh, it has been found out, the, the human uh, genome project has, uh, has found out the entire sequence also and uh, it has been found out that only 75 to 85 uh, genes out of the total of uh, around 400 genes are actually active and the homologous areas are only the pseudo autosomal areas. So, if we are asked to just classify the different areas, then we have the pseudo autosomal areas on the two extremes. The, the dark one, the entire thing is heterochromatin, which is genetically inert and the, the genes are either uh, faulty sequences or repetitive DNA or they are present in the form of a, of a junk DNA. But then the portion which is eochromatin resides near the centromere. And there is a very interesting region which is present very, very close to the upper pseudo autosomal region and this is called as the SRY. We will just come to that and have a detailed discussion. 95 percent therefore y of the Y chromosome is not going to synapse or crossover or exchange genes or recombine with the X chromosomes. So, this was called as the NRY. The NRY would mean that the NRY is a non-recombining region of Y. We have changed the terminology now. Now, it is called as MSY, which is the male specific region of Y. Now, this uh, term of MSY seems to be perhaps more expressive because it wants to convey to us that this is a region which is exclusive to the Y chromosome and hence to maleness and therefore it is uh, more appropriate to call it as MSY. Now the SRY is actually the region which is which was first discovered in the in the chromosomes of uh, mouse and uh, there just to avoid confusion again, we have the terminology in all caps as far as SRY is concerned and s capital S and small ry for mouse. Now, this particular region is located on the Y chromosome as we saw in the diagram absolutely adjacent to the pseudo autosomal region and there could be some discrepancies in certain cases and some slips, genetical slips, so that a part of this SRY could also go to the X, we would see this. So, this particular region or the SRY is the sex determining region of Y, which is around 250 base pairs in length and it can code for about 80 amino acid motifs. The most important thing is that it 
is a conserved sequence. By saying that it is a conserved sequence, we would mean that this particular sequence would be the same in all the forms of the chromosomes which we have studied so far. And it is this particular SRY region which is the critical switch as far as the sex determination for maleness is concerned. This SRY has what is called as the TDF or the testes determining factors. So, if there is SRI, SRY, there would be the presence of TDS and the mammal would be a male. Another very interesting aspect would be that uh, in the placental mammals including the humans, maleness is basically due to the dominant effect of this Y chromosome. How do we prove that? If there is an animal which is XO, XO would mean that there is a solitary X chromosome and there is no Y chromosome. So, in this case, it would be a female. One would argue that no, two X's are required for being a female. Here, one X was enough to, to have a female. On the other hand, which we have, say for example, uh, Kleinfelter syndrome, which is XXY, the presence of Y dominates over even 2X taken together and the overall sex of the progeny becomes a male. So, this again justifies the, the dominance of the Y chromosome that it has on the sex determining mechanism. The case of manifestation of the SRY actually begins with its role in secreting certain hormones and these hormones are going to metamorphose, uh, uh, they, they are going to influence the metamorphosis of different types of gonads. In the diagram we find that if there is no Y chromosome, say for example in a female on the left side, then no, there is no TDF because there was no SRY and there was no TDF. If there was no TDF, then the gonads of the child would develop into ovaries. Why? Because the testes differentiating factor had to synthesize the hormone testosterone. And since there is no TDF, there is no testosterone and as a result, the female sexual characteristics would develop. The diagram on the right hand side has the genotype of, of uh, the, the male which has one X chromosome and a Y chromosome with a perfect SRY gene. So, the SRY gene is responsible for the differentiation of testes determining factor and as a result, now the embryonic gonads or the medulla is going to develop testes, later the presence of testosterone and this hormone would initiate the development of the male sexual characteristics. So, this is how the presence of a gene and its components are going to determine and of course, initiate the synthesis of the right hormones which take the metamorphosis into a particular direction, whether of maleness or femaleness. <clears throat> there are some very interesting aspects uh, and uh, one can ask such questions to one's friends also uh, and it is a jugglery of genetics. Our common notion is that you are a female, so you have to be XX. Oh, you are a male, you are XY. One can even joke about it. But are you familiar of certain situations where there is a male and its genotype shows XX? That is very interesting. And likewise, there would be a female with a genetic complement of XY. What really happens is, if during the crossing over or spermatogenesis, 
because the the uh, male would have in its testes the the x and the y and at the time of meiosis they have to uh, genetically recombine and uh, have their chromosomes if by chance as i said earlier genetic slip so nature also falters many a times and uh, it would so happen that by mistake or an error the portion of the sry also goes from the y chromosome to the x chromosome along with the pseudo autosomal region it should not have gone but then it goes so that means now finally the x chromosome would have sry and the y chromosome will lose the y chromosome will lose its segment which was containing sry so the female has only x at the time of fertilization the female of x fuses with the x of the male which had sry simply by the presence of sry the progeny becomes a female even though the genotype shows xx which is very very unusual and behavior wise this uh, particular female would have different types of abnormalities of course one would be sterile and not all the uh, all the feminine sexual characters would be seen because the, the male characters are also there on the other hand we would have an xy female in spite of having the y chromosome so that means these are some of the abnormal situations which may arise due to the uh, due to the faulty crossing over and this is all because of the fact of the strategic and the sensitive position which the sry enjoys just adjacent to the uh, the par region which is the pseudo autosomal region so that means mistakes can can happen there uh it would be wrong to say and give the entire credit to the sry for manifesting the maleness in a child the perfect male would be having an x and a y of course as i said that y along with its sry is important but then recently it has been found out that there is a gene which is present on the x chromosome which will also be responsible to act as a testosterone receptor in other words if we have the complement of a human child as 22 aa plus yo one could argue okay there is one y why not a normal male it would again not be a normal male because y is alone in other words it requires an x also because what happens is that the sry gene uh, controls the formation of the testes the determining factor and the testosterone is there but then how would the testosterone act unless there is a testosterone receptor and the gene for making the testosterone testo, uh, testosterone receptor it resides on the longer arm which is the q arm of the x chromosome and the differentiation or the triggering of the differentiation has to be initiated by this testosterone receptor and then finally the male secondary sexual characters would come in other words the presence of a normal y why i said normal because with the sry gene along with the x chromosome both of them are essential because they work in tandem for determining the sex because then the testosterone receptor complex would work normally this can be proved by mutating the uh, the gene on the x chromosome and if there would be no receptor then y cannot act alone as far as the sex determination is concerned so in other words the y chromosome has the sex determining genes in the form of sry and uh, it can really dominate everything this 
we can we can find out from the evidences from the syndromes because you know uh, as i said earlier there, there are certain children who are born with chromosomal deformities especially to women of advanced age because at that time that there's a there's a discrepancy in meiosis and uh, things may happen due to hormonal changes the the chromosomes may not move the way they are moving and the segregation is not proper so turner syndrome would show 22 aa plus xo that means there's no y now in the absence of y the progeny is a female but then it is a sterile female and Klinefelter syndrome showed that there was no meiosis between one of the gametes, and especially the gamete was the male one. So the male gamete remained as X Y, and then it fused with the X ovum, and it gave rise to Klinefelter syndrome. Now the presence of two X and a Y is also abnormal. It would be a male Y because we have been saying all along that Y dominates over everything. But then there are two X. This is again an abnormality, and this Klinefelter syndrome would be a male with many feminine characters because it has two X's. Likewise, we see in our society various hermaphrodites. Now, hermaphrodites would mean that there has not been proper meiosis in both the cases or both the gametes, and therefore an organism would show both male and female characters. so in such type of transgenders we have again an element of of sterility but then the fact remains that y uh, dominates over x in most of the cases i think we can stop here and uh, take up the story of of the other genetic mechanisms uh, in the subsequent lecture thank you dr eklave um we do uh, get a very great insight into mechanism of sex in determination and genes and genetics of uh, male and female both so if you have any questions or suggestions regarding this lecture you may write in to us at info.cc@nic.in and uh, we must thank uh, all of you for joining us for this lecture and dr chohan as well thank you sir thank you very much thank you